coming <clears throat> to today um, in a recent New Yorker piece, an interview with you with Isaac Chutner. Uh, the headline on it is why John Mearsheimer blames the U.S. for the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, wh why do you? Well, I think there are two ways of thinking about the causes of the present crisis, which, of course, uh, now involves a war in Ukraine. Uh, the first view, which is the conventional wisdom, for sure, uh, in the West and certainly in the United States, is that Putin is to blame uh, and that Putin is a revanchist. He's interested in either recreating the Soviet Union or he's interested in creating a greater Russia that looks like uh, the former Soviet Union. And, and what's going on in Ukraine is the first move in that direction. That's one view. The other view, which is my view, is this is all about NATO expansion. And the taproot of the problem is the April 2008 NATO decision. This is a decision was made at the NATO summit in Bucharest, Bucharest in uh, April 2008 to include both Georgia and Ukraine in NATO. The Russians said at the time, Putin in particular, but all of the Russian elites, that this is categorically unacceptable. We are drawing a red line in the sand. Georgia and Ukraine are not going to become part of NATO. And indeed, in August of 2008, you had a war over Georgia. And that was all about NATO expansion. Then the Ukraine crisis broke out into the open on February 22nd, 2014. Uh, and it continues to this day. And in my opinion, it is all about NATO expansion. The Russians have made it unequivocally clear that Ukraine is not going to become part of NATO. But at the same time, the United States refuses to accept Russia's position on that matter. And we have continued to push to incorporate Ukraine into NATO. And the end result is we had a second major crisis break out in December of last year. That's December 2021. And then on February 24th of this year, it turned into a hot war. So my view is this is not a case of Putin uh, trying to recreate the Soviet Union. In fact, there's no hard evidence at all that he has ever said that that was his goal, that he thought that that was even feasible. This is no evidence of that. And in fact, what he has said ad nauseum and his lieutenants to include people like Sergei Lavrov, had said, have said ad nauseum, is that this is all about NATO expansion, which it is. What do you think of NATO? Well, I think that NATO does an excellent job of maintaining the peace in most of Europe because it keeps the Americans in Europe and the Americans act as a pacifier. And that worked uh, certainly during the Cold War, and it worked with the first tranche of NATO expansion, which included Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. And it worked with the second tranche of NATO expansion. That was in 2004. The first tranche was in 1999. Uh, so up until then, NATO served a useful purpose in keeping the peace in Europe. But then in 2008, we decided there was going to be a major tranche that included major tranche of expansion that included Ukraine and Georgia. And as I said to you before, that led to disaster. The Soviets said, or excuse me, the Russians said that is not happening. And we're in this crisis today. So I, I think NATO worked well for a while. And you want to remember that when the Cold War ended, when the Cold War ended, then the Soviet Union wanted NATO to remain intact, and it wanted the Americans to remain in Europe, mainly to keep the Germans down. So the Soviet Union, and then later Russia, was not against the existence of NATO. What they were opposed to was NATO expansion. The Russians did not want NATO expansion, and they tolerated it two times, in 99 and in 2004. 
But after 2008, it became a hot button issue and it led to the crisis today. Now, the fact is that in the West, most people do not accept that argument, because if you accept that argument, you are in effect blaming the West for the crisis. You are blaming the United States for the present crisis. And nobody in the West wants that charge leveled against them. Instead, they want to blame Vladimir Putin. So what they've done is they've invented this story that Vladimir Putin is a revanchist, that he's interested in creating a new version of the Soviet Union, even though there's no evidence to support that. But it's a palatable line of argument in the West, and therefore people have glommed onto it. There are some 30 countries in NATO, <clears throat> excuse me, but the United States pays but I think something like 69% of the defense costs. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, it makes perfect sense from the perspective of the other NATO members to let Uncle Sam pay the bills. I mean, this is a case where you want to pass the buck to Uncle Sam. Second, it's in Uncle Sam's interest to some extent to have full control over NATO and to not have powerful allies who would therefore have a lot of say in how the alliance runs. So I actually think we have been somewhat willing to allow our allies to have small and relatively weak militaries in good part because that does not allow them to challenge us very much regarding NATO policy. So I think this all makes sense. And until recently, NATO, with this distribution of responsibilities, did a good job of keeping the peace. But now we've made a hash of things. We have this huge problem in Eastern Europe that doesn't appear to be going away. And we're going to have to up the ante. Uh, we're going to have to spend more money. And this is a huge problem for the United States because Russia's not a serious threat to the United States. There is a serious threat in the system. There is a pure competitor out there. It's called China. And the United States should be focusing laser-like on containing China. We should actually be pivoting to Asia and pivoting out of Europe. The fact that we're getting more deeply involved in Eastern Europe and taking our eye off the ball in East Asia is a colossal strategic blunder. This is why I argue that the country that is going to benefit the most from the Ukraine crisis is China. Because China has to worry less about America being on its doorstep pursuing a vigorous containment policy because the United States has foolishly bogged itself down on, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. The United States have a couple hundred thousand military people around the world, something like 800 bases throughout the world. Uh, we still have a a lot of troops in Japan and South Korea. Good idea? Some of those troops uh, are uh, uh, definitely needed. Uh, I mean, uh, we uh, have uh, military commitments that really matter in both the Persian Gulf and in East Asia. Uh, and as Chinese power grows and China begins to build the Blue Water Navy and it begins to project power around the world, many of those bases will come in handy. Uh, so I think in terms of most of the bases, it makes eminently good sense. Uh, I think the really interesting question is how we should think about Europe. Uh, one could argue that we should get out of Europe and pivot completely to East Asia, and to the extent that we worry about another region of the world, that other region should be the Persian Gulf, because all that oil is there, and also because the Chinese are now forming close relations with both the Iranians and the Saudis and other Gulf states. Uh, the Chinese are going to be deeply involved in the Gulf, and because the Chinese are our principal threat in the system, 
uh, the Gulf is going to matter for that reason, in addition to the fact that you have all that oil there. Uh, so one could argue that what we need to do is reduce our military bases in Europe. I would be fully in favor of that. But as I said to you earlier, if anything, we're going in the opposite direction.